Well, amen. It would not be right to have a day like today and not sing because he lives. Thank you, Cindy, very, very much for that beautiful um, hymn that you just sang. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning, a variation from our run through, a slow walk, better said, through the book of Ephesians. And I want um, you to find that passage, 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23, and we will read through verse 32 this morning. The Word of God says the following, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged." But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Father, your words are infallible. Not a one will fall to the ground. You will accomplish your purpose. Give me the ability to preach this message for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray it in his name. Amen. As a boy, I looked forward to coming to Mississippi. I looked forward to gathering with cousins and aunts and uncles along with my grandparents. I looked forward to the little church, Riverside Baptist Church, where we would attend there in Jones County during the summer months. And the best part, now think of it, I was a boy. The best part was dinner on the grounds. Now we didn't call it that, we called it dinner on the ground. Drop the S there, you know. But outside under the oak trees they had these big old tables. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. And they were there so long the wood went like this underneath it. And they would set up on those tables. They would cover them with these beautiful, bright tablecloths, cloth cloth, not the plastic stuff like we buy today. Buy today. They would cover it, and then they would cover it with food, and yes, Bob, somewhere on that table there was okra. But let me tell you how far away it was from the fried chicken. <laughs> because the fried chicken was in the center. I mean, we're talking about green beans and macaroni and cheese and all kinds of rolls and all this rich, delicious, wonderful food. And it was all there but that fried chicken. Oh my goodness, that fried chicken. Because a lot of the folks there Ms. Carolyn, they were chicken farmers. And so they'd go out to their chicken houses. In fact, I remember doing it for my granddaddy, and he had an old, old hook, and I'd go out there, and I'd hook one of those things, and, and um, that would become 
the contribution for that meal on that day. What a wonderful, wonderful celebration. The Lord's Supper is also a great celebration. We're only going to have one celebration greater, and that's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And until that time, until that day, which I believe is soon coming, until that day, the Lord's Supper will be the great celebration of Christ's church here on the earth. And I'm going to show you two simple reasons from verse 26 why the Lord's Supper is the great celebration, the greatest we will celebrate here while on earth. And what he says to us, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So very simply, let me remind you, we declare the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can rejoice because Jesus Christ's death has finished off the power of death. The death of Jesus has finished off the power of death. Just listen to the Word of God in 2 Timothy, if you would. Uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I want you to hear this and, and see this in 2 Timothy. It's, it's a beautiful passage. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me. Can I stop? Don't be ashamed of the fact Jesus died for your sins. Don't let that be a point of shame for you. I shared with a man across the table from him one time in a public restaurant. Um, you know my voice carries across town a lot of times. And there I was talking about the, the, the power, the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time I said something about Jesus, Scott, he would hang his head. It embarrassed him. If you know Jesus, you will not be ashamed. If you are ashamed at the name of Jesus Christ, we need to have a conversation. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Listen, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This means that Jesus put death out of a full-time job when it comes to Christ followers. It means that the power of death that that power it had over you, that sway it held you with, has been destroyed. The words of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. It means that Jesus abolished the master of death. In the book of Hebrews and the second chapter or verse that I shared not too terribly long ago with some of you, the Word of God says this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. It's the same word. The word destroy is the same word as abolished right there. There is no greater evidence of the victory that Jesus had over death than this, his resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, my Lord Jesus, God raised him from the dead. He went to the cross. 
He suffered and died because of my sin. He carried every despicable, horrible, conceivable thing that my sin nature could ever, ever come up with. And there he rendered it null and void on the cross. And the Bible says this about what the Lord Jesus did who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. God looked at the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. God saw the blood that it was sinless, that it was spotless. God saw that Jesus fulfilled every obligation that God had placed on him from time and eternity. And he did it without spot, without sin, without failing. And God said, that's good enough. And there he raised Jesus because he justified us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no greater evidence than that right there. So rejoice, ladies and gentlemen, because Jesus' death finished off the power of death. Rejoice because through Jesus' death, we are set free from death. The wages of sin is death, but we are set free from the penalty of death. We are set free from the pain of death. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we read this words that you've heard a hundred if not a thousand times. O death where is your sting? O grave where is your victory? Ladies and gentlemen, this is what God says to us before you met Christ Jesus, before Christ Jesus died on that cross. Every time a person died, death took a large thorn, a large spear, and poked it in the heart of everyone around. I've seen people die without Christ. I've seen people who refuse to come to Christ die. You don't want to be there. You don't want to see it. You know when their eyes open wide and that sudden gasp that they realize everything, everything they claimed was wrong and that Jesus was right. And then... Dr. Berger to have to preach that kind of funeral. And one lady came up to me and said, please don't tell me where my daddy is. Please don't mention it. I said, I'm not saying a word about that. I want to talk to you about peace you can have with God. He's dead. I can't do anything about him. But I can talk to you. And I can talk to you and you. I can talk to us today. Jesus' death and his subsequent resurrection frees us from the pain of death. We declare the death of Jesus through this supper. But guess what? There's another phrase at the end there. Till he come. We declare the definite return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, how many of you know and believe that Jesus is coming again? You know his return is going to be literal? There you see those disciples outside of Jerusalem when Jesus said you're going to hang out here in Jerusalem you're going to tarry here and uh, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to be my witnesses all of that passes and then Jesus was received up from out of their sight I read a thing the other day by the way I've got to, I've got to go back into it I, and, and study it some more but um, 
the guy was talking about the doctrine least preached in the church, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, and why the ascension was important. Well, there's one thing about the ascension that, um, that is stated very clearly in Acts 111, when these angels are standing there, it says two men, but we know they're angels, and um, he says, you, you men of Galilee, you Galileans, you know, Galileans were always being insulted, Ronnie, back then. Uh, if they want to insult somebody, you just call them a Galilean. You know, it's like calling them a redneck from Mississippi. And um, worse, a Cajun from Louisiana, you know. I better preach on this side for a while. They might throw things at me. Oh, listen to me, y'all. That those angels stood there and said, this same Jesus that was taken from you will come again the same way he went up. He's coming back down. And I'm telling you, I am persuaded with all my heart that it's going to be any moment in time now that our Lord Jesus is coming back. Here's what you need to know. His return will be literal. His return will be surprising. The rapture of the church will be surprising. The physical second coming of Christ, when Christ comes and steps, steps foot on this earth again, when he steps onto the Mount of Olives, and when the ground splits between his feet and runs right down into the <clears throat> Kidron Valley, in that place, it's going to be like a thief. It will be so surprising. Some will say, I didn't expect it. If only I had a little bit more time. His return will be delightful for some, dreadful for others. Because some know this doctrine of the rapture of the church, of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they keep saying, as you read in Scripture, in the parables, I got a little more time. I have some more time. I don't need to make that decision for Christ today. I have more time. But it'll be too late. It will be too late. I know you believe it. But how many of you think about the return of Christ and the rapture of the church? How many of you have that in your thoughts? The early church, every time you turned around, they thought about it. They mentioned it. Became a problem for one or two who said, he's coming tomorrow, no use getting that job. And wouldn't work. And Paul finally said, if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. Y'all remember that? But he never said, don't think about it. Just live as though the Lord were returning today. You may ask, why? Why would I think about that? In fact, I know people who very earnestly and sincerely tell me they're praying the Lord delay his return. I understand that. These usually that have said that to me are missionaries. They're out there on the field. And they're saying, oh, I hope he holds off and doesn't come today. <laughs> My grandson said it to me Friday. He's talking about his vacation. He's down there somewhere on Destin. And he said, I hope the Lord doesn't come back until after this week. <laughs> I understand that. Ten-year-old mind. I know 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds that think that way. Probably some 50 and 60-year-olds think that way. As I understand it, I understand scripture the more we think about the return of Christ the busier we are in the things of Christ let me show you why let me show you what happens when we think about the rapture I want you to look over at first John 
uh, chapter 3 for a moment, please. Go over there in the New Testament, 1 John. I want to show you a passage of Scripture. I want you to see this in 1 John. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We're going to read that. Look at the Word of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Not future tense, present tense. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now that's good, isn't it? That part's good. Watch this. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. When a person is thinking on the return of Jesus, they become more sin conscious. They become more careful about their decisions they make. They become more deliberate in lifestyle choices. Because everyone that has the hope of the return of Christ purifies himself even as he is pure. Everyone who expects the soon return of Jesus Christ will develop more compassion for sinners who need to be saved. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Y'all remember that passage? The next verse, however, is the one we often forget. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing that Christ will come, that the rapture could happen even before we finish this morning, knowing that truth, because of that, in knowing the sure judgment of those who do not know Christ, we persuade men. One of the sad statistics of the church, the church, the evangelical church of today, is that fewer and fewer believe in the doctrine of hell. The evidence is found in our dwindling numbers across the land. We're not busy reaching out to the lost because we're not really sure if they're going to die and go to hell or not. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Every time we celebrate this supper, it should be on our mind, Jesus Christ is coming again and may come quickly. Let me bring this to a close. Someone said, we must take the bread and the fruit of the vine willingly. We must take it worthily, and we must take it watchfully. I want to add a fourth one to that. We must take it worshipfully. We take it willingly when we see that this is a delight and a blessing to enjoy. We take it worthily 
when we know we've confessed our sins, when we are not part or party to a divisive spirit, when we're not living with one foot in the world and the other in the body of Christ. We take it watchfully when we recognize the price Jesus paid and the bride that Jesus bought. We keep in mind both the literal body of Christ and the spiritual body of Christ, which is the church. And we take it worshipfully because this is the most wonderful act of worship. We are expressing thanksgiving and praise and love to our Lord Jesus Christ when we partake of this great celebration. Now let me tell you who may partake in this today beyond what I have said. If you're born again, that means if you have repented of your sins and placed your entire faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and been baptized as a believer, you'll be able to partake of this. Now why would I say it like that? Because the New Testament evidence that you've been truly born again as you desire to identify with Jesus personally as well as publicly. And the public way of identification, faith, it's baptism, isn't it, sister? You're baptized because you believe and after you have believed. I'm going to give you a moment to examine your heart. And if there's sin that rises up into your mind as a believer in Christ Jesus, you need to confess it. You need to repent of it. You need to prepare yourself. Bow our heads. Beloved and righteous Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit examine every heart present. I ask that the Holy Spirit reveal to every believer present. whether or not they are harboring things they've not confessed so that they may confess it. Let the Holy Spirit convict or let him convince of righteousness. Let him perturb or let him grant peace, Father. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on down, men, help me.
take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I just uh, thank you for this day, and Lord, I thank you for this supper, Lord, for what it represents, Lord, and Lord, especially for your blood, Lord, that was shed, Lord, so that it would cover all of our sins, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you for the fact that when God looks at us, Lord, all he sees is you, Lord, that your blood paid the price for us, Lord, and I thank you for that. 
I pray that you be with this, continue to be with this service, just leading God in each and every aspect of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ladies and gentlemen, if your heart was stirred that you needed perhaps a relationship with Christ Jesus today, then we want to extend this time of invitation. If your heart was burdened that you needed a fresh encounter with the Lord Jesus, we want this to be that moment for you. <clears throat>